Is assaulted nuclear bomb even deadlier than regular thermonuclear bombs? Myths and facts. As you have probably heard, salted nuclear bombs, which is a kind of thermonuclear bomb and is also known as cobalt bombs, are propagated as doomsday bombs. Do we need to worry about cobalt bombs on top of everything else? The answer is no. Cobalt bombs are not very effective doomsday machines and from a radiological standpoint, regular thermonuclear weapons are worse than cobalt bombs. But why? To understand this we should know how a thermonuclear bomb works. Exact designs of thermonuclear weapons remain a state secret, but most experts believe that the bomb is set up in two stages. The primary stage, fission, triggers the secondary stage, fusion. The result is an extremely powerful and theoretically limitless explosion. Stage 1. Nuclear Fission Thermonuclear bombs rely on a primary process called nuclear fission, in which a conventional explosion triggers a chain reaction that splits the nuclei of large atoms, resulting in a nuclear explosion. For this to occur, Weapons-grade fissile material either uranium-235 or plutonium-239 must reach critical mass. In thermonuclear weapons, an implosion bomb achieves critical mass through the inward compression of fissionable material, such as plutonium. The device is typically spherical, with the outermost shell being made up of conventional explosives. The innermost portion contains a hollow plutonium pit filled with some form of hydrogen fuels, namely deuterium and tritium in gaseous form. As the outermost layer of the sphere explodes, heat and energy are directed toward the center using a series of explosive lenses, and the plutonium pit begins to shrink into itself. The density of the particles rapidly increases and efficient chain reaction is caused by release of neutrons from a neutron source resulting in a nuclear explosion. Stage 2. Nuclear Fusion The primary fission explosion produces high-energy gamma and X-rays, which are channeled downward and reflected toward the fusion device. The outer casing of the secondary assembly is called the tamper pusher which is heated so extremely by the primary's X-ray flux that they expand violently and ablate away or fly off. Because total momentum is conserved, this mass of high-velocity ejecta impels the rest of the tamper pusher to recoil inwards with tremendous force, crushing the fusion fuel and the spark plug. The tamper pusher is built robustly enough to insulate the fusion fuel from the extreme heat outside otherwise the compression would be spoiled. A compound known as lithium deuteride, which is created by combining lithium and deuterium, is used as the fusion fuel in modern thermonuclear weapons. The heat and pressure from the primary explosion cause the fusion fuel, lithium deuteride, surrounding the spark plug to react, releasing tritium. This occurs after the spark plug initiates and releases neutron flux which will be captured by lithium creating tritium. The tritium then fuses with the deuterium to form helium, nuclear fusion, and more neutrons are released. The free neutrons cause additional fission reactions which creates more pressure on the lithium deuteride, producing more fusion reactions. The positive feedback loop between fission and fusion continues until a massive explosion occurs. One of the key points here to enhance the yield of a thermonuclear weapon is that the neutrons from fusion reactions can further cause fissions in the tamper which is usually uranium-238. Indeed more than half of the yield of thermonuclear bombs stems exactly from the fission of the uranium tamper in the second stage. The fission of the uranium-238 tamper by neutrons from the fusion reactions is massively responsible for the nuclear fallout. Now in order to make the bomb even more deadly from a radiological standpoint, physicists thought of replacing the uranium tamper with a cobalt-59 tamper to create a cobalt bomb or a salted nuclear bomb producing even more radiological hazards. However by doing so the yield of nuclear bomb is reduced as cobalt is not a fissile material. The nuclear physicist Leo Szilard first proposed the idea of the cobalt bomb in 1950. He calculated that 50 tons of neutrons absorbed by non-radioactive cobalt-59 and dispersed evenly over the Earth's surface would be plenty to kill everybody. The idea was that one or more enormous stationary bombs would suffice to create enough global fallout to create lethal radiation hazards everywhere on Earth. 
scientists and strategists in the 1950s took the idea of cobalt bombs very seriously. The American physicist Herman Kahn believed that the cobalt bomb could be harnessed to build a doomsday machine and that someone might very well attempt to build such a machine. However, cobalt bombs turn out to be far less lethal and far less practical than Szilard's back-of-the-envelope calculation suggested in 1950. Firstly, Szilard assumed that the plentiful neutrons from fusion could be harnessed efficiently to convert common cobalt-59 into radioactive cobalt-60. But it turns out that these high-energy neutrons need to be slowed down, moderated, before cobalt-59 will absorb them. Fusion neutrons have an energy of about 14 MeV, which means they are moving at high speed. When these fast neutrons hit a cobalt-59 nucleus, they tend not to stick and form cobalt-60, but rather cause other reactions like knocking other neutrons out of the co-59 nucleus. At 14 mega electron volts or MeV, the neutrons are something like 50,000 times less likely to be captured and form cobalt-60 than they are at the energies typical in a medical isotope production reactor. Most nuclear reactors use moderators, such as water or graphite, to slow fast neutrons down to lower energies, but doing the same inside of a detonating nuclear weapon is astronomically more difficult. And even if we could harness the fusion neutrons to produce cobalt-60 the way Szilard envisioned, it turns out that the resulting fallout would probably be less lethal than the fallout from a conventional thermonuclear weapon. This is because most thermonuclear weapons produce a large fraction of their yield from fission reactions, and the resulting fission products are extraordinarily radioactive. It turns out that fast neutrons from fusion can be used to fission uranium atoms, which in turn produces more neutrons in addition to more fission products. So each neutron fissioning uranium produces far more radioactive hazard than a neutron producing a cobalt-60 atom. Fission products are so radioactive that most of them decay within minutes or hours, often before fallout reaches the ground. Szilard suggested that cobalt-60 would be far more lethal because its 5.27-year half-life would result in larger accumulated doses. But it turns out that the fission products are so much more radioactive than cobalt-60 that the accumulated radiation exposure relative to neutrons expended only starts to favor cobalt-60 about six years after the explosion. Conventional thermonuclear bombs are therefore highly efficient radiological weapons. As British radiobiologist Joseph Rotblat noted in 1955, the hydrogen-uranium bomb is a kind of cobalt bomb. In fact, in some respects it is even worse. It is often claimed that the scary Russian torpedo Poseidon is equipped with a salted nuclear bomb to cause enormous radioactive contamination. Now you know that these claims are absolutely unfounded and this admittedly very potent weapon will carry a devastating megaton TNT-sized thermonuclear warhead. So you can rest easy that cobalt bombs are one nuclear nightmare that you probably don't need to lose sleep over. But that's in part because the fallout from typical nuclear weapons is lethal enough that it's very difficult to make it even deadlier. Thanks for watching and see you next time.